Good afternoon from Singapore and good morning to all our friends tuning in from the Netherlands. Thank you and welcome to this session where we will be talking about the future of mobility as a service and autonomous vehicles. My name is Wei Min from SG Innovate and those who may know, SG Innovate is a government-backed deep tech investor and company builder whose mission is to help entrepreneurial scientists build deep tech startups that are looking to solve big global problems. Our work also involves building a global community of leaders, thinkers, and doers to drive and scale up deep tech innovations in areas such as AI, healthcare, quantum tech, and autonomous technology across various industries. Today, we are very happy to be collaborating with the Netherlands Innovation Network of the Netherlands Embassy in Singapore to be able to bring you this webinar today. One of the key functions of the Netherlands Innovation Network is to also assist companies and knowledge institutes in Singapore and the Netherlands to establish R&D collaborations. The Netherlands and Singapore has been making great headway in the field of autonomous vehicles in recent years, which brings us to today's event, where our speakers will share more on their work and their views on the readiness of mobility as a service in both regions and prepare us for any innovations that may come in the future for autonomous vehicles. For today's webinar, we also encourage for all attendees to share with us your thoughts on the topic or interact with our speakers by posting your questions in the Q&A tab located at the bottom panel of the screen. We will be also launching a series of posts as well. Otherwise, feel free to just say hi and do a quick shout out from where you are in the chat box below. Also, if you are, you are more than welcome to connect with us or with the Netherlands Innovation Network via LinkedIn, details will be shared in the chat. With no further ado, do allow me to pass the time to our moderator for today, Amelia Silvers, Cluster Program Manager and Scientist from the Integrated Vehicle Safety Department in the TNO, which is the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research, to start the session. Amelia, please. Thank you, Weimin. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, my name is Emilia Silvash and I will be your host today. Welcome to this webinar, like Wayman said, on artificial intelligence related to uh, mobility and transport. Uh, we will touch upon today uh, with our guests uh, on different topics in these domains. And I'm here uh, to represent the Dutch AI Artificial Intelligence Coalition. Uh, this coalition has been established uh, more than a year ago and it aims to strengthen and um, increase the collaboration between different parties. Um, in the Dutch ecosystem, but it's also looking internationally. And that's why we are here today. Before we um, start, I want to say I'm very pleased to um, have today four uh, well-known um, uh, guests in the well, uh, four well-known uh, speakers in their own domains. Um, and I'm going to share my screen such that uh, you see the content we have prepared for you today. So I'm uh, um, going to start with introducing Akash uh, Pasi. Uh, he's the senior vice president at Volvo Bus and uh, Bus Corporation. Welcome, Akash. Um, then we have uh, James Fu, uh, director of technology at Motiono. We have Heis Dubuman, uh, CTO at AI in Motion, and we also have Olap on the, of the Camp, a senior consultant at TNO, uh, which is the Dutch. Uh, Organization for Applied Scientific Research. Before I give them the floor to introduce themselves and say which applications they are working on, I want to first give you a first inter an introduction about the uh, Dutch Artificial Intelligence Coalition, what is the structure and what we are focusing on. After that, uh, we will dive with our speakers in the three questions that we have prepared. As you all know, artificial intelligence has shown a lot of potential in the last years, which means... Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, which means that um, it is a good time now to get together and um, and talk about it and understand where are we now and where are we heading? What are the challenges from the companies and the local ecosystems? So the Dutch AI coalition has been established a year ago and it aims to stimulate, support and organize artificial intelligence activities in the Netherlands between different um, partners from academia to startups to um, large companies or uh, uh, municipalities and governments. This is a joint approach for collaboration and common challenges. Um, it has the structure which is shown here. Uh, there are different application areas and the one we are going to focus on today is the mobility transport and logistics one. Um, these application areas are cross-cutting other topics, which are more generic, the human capital, data sharing, social acceptance, etc. If you want to see more information about the Dutch AI coalition, you can follow the link, which is on the right. 
Um, and let's now focus on the mobility, transport and logistics working group and what are the themes that we are looking into for this working group. We have identified, uh, yeah? Amelia, uh, yes? I think, could you maybe share the slide, try attempting attempt to share the slides again? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, that means you have not seen my slides so far, right? Yes. Ah, that's, that's bad. Uh, okay. Do you see my screen now? Yep, I think you can put it on present. Yep, they're perfect. Oh, I'm very sorry. Um, so I will just scan through very fast. These are our, our uh, speakers, uh, Akash, James, Heiss, and Olaf. Welcome to you all. Um, I mentioned the, the companies that they belong to, and uh, I was showing to you uh, just now the uh, structure of the Dutch AI coalition, which is uh, this one. Um, the vertical areas are application driven and the horizontal ones are uh, different, um, more broader research uh, and development topics. The combination between application areas and these horizontal topics um, lead to different challenges over different applications and different domains. And um, I would like to have a look with you at the main challenges and the main themes uh, that are part of the mobility and transport uh, and logistics group. So those are these four themes. Uh, safe, shared, flexible mobility, accessibility and traffic flow, sustainable mobility, and efficient logistics. We are touching today with our speakers on multiple of these themes, and um, we have prepared some questions that the speakers uh, will address with us. But before we do that, um, touch upon different, um, different aspects of the mobility and, and transport things, I would like to give the floor to our speakers to tell us um, what do they work on? What are the challenges that they see? And to introduce themselves. So I will start with Olaf. Um, Olaf, you have the floor to explain what you are focusing on. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, working for the uh, for Tino in the in the Netherlands, uh, as already said, the independent organization for uh, applied scientific research. Uh, I have the role there of a senior consultant, and I work for both authorities and. Um, uh, mainly automotive uh, uh, industry uh, partners uh, with a focus on the development of uh, and application of safety assessment methods and uh, tools. And that deals with uh, current state-of-the-art uh, safety systems on board of, uh, of vehicles, such as uh, advanced driver assistance systems. Um, but we also work heavily uh, towards uh, connected automated uh, uh, driving systems. And in that respect, I'm uh, have been seconded to uh, to the NTU in uh, in, in Singapore uh, for the last years, uh, working part of my time to the CITRON uh, program, the Center of Excellence for Testing and Research of uh, of AVs in, uh, in in Singapore, and there we have been uh, uh, working with authorities and uh, industry uh, towards setting a safety assessment uh, framework that is able to deal with uh, AVs. Now, the AV uh, um, domain is, is uh, changing uh, rapidly. And one of the, the reasons thereof is the inclusion of artificial intelligence into uh, the smart uh, systems of these, uh, these vehicles. And that poses a lot of uh, opportunities in, in making uh, innovations in this type of, uh, of systems. But what I would like to address uh, today is that it also poses uh, several challenges um, that we really have to uh, have to address um, in in uh, actually uh, as as soon as possible. Great, thank you very much, Olaf. Uh, that's very interesting. I think multiple of our speakers are recognizing the same areas. I hope also the people in the audience have questions about these topics. I'm sure they do. Um, I will uh, then give the floor to um, Akash um, if he can also introduce himself and uh, what is your focus area. Thank you, Emilia. Uh, as Emilia said, I represent uh, Volvo Buses. Uh, at Volvo Buses, we consider ourselves a leader in safe, sustainable, passenger-friendly transportation solutions. I would say that uh, in my role over the last 10 years, I have the, had the responsibility for managing the operations and markets of uh, the international markets around the world, except uh, Europe and North America. During the course of my over 25 years of experience in the transport uh, industry, uh, I have seen many initiatives either succeed or fail. And 
when I reflect on the reason why, uh, I believe that, let's say if there is a bus rapid transport system, transit system, and if the system has put the passengers in the center of its requirement, then the transport system works well, it identifies with people, and it is able to attract a large number of people who in a normal course would have either driven personal means of transport like cars or two wheelers. And if the focus has not been on the passenger, but making a nice efficient system, the system really doesn't work. However, uh, today I'm here that over the last five years, uh, we at Volvo have had the privilege of working with stakeholders across the government, the industry and academia in Singapore, in particularly with partnership with LTA and NTU to introduce over the last couple of years, the world's first, first full-size autonomous bus. This has also given me an insight of how autonomous vehicle solutions can and should be introduced in society in a safe, sustainable and passenger friendly manner. Thank you. Thank you, Akash. That's that's very interesting. So um, a lot of uh, companies probably focus now on, on the users. So that's a very good angle. Um, I will give now the floor to um, uh, Heis and Heis can tell us more about their applications. Heis. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, hello, everybody um, in Singapore and across the world. Uh, I am Heis Dubbelman and I'm a, the CTO of AI in Motion. AI in Motion is a startup of the University of uh, uh, Technology in Eindhoven. Um, our background is in deep learning technology for mapping, localization, and perception. And uh, a few years ago, uh, we were researching self-driving vehicles, which is also uh, the topic of today. But we also recognize that this technology has much broader applications uh, outside, uh, let's say, the self-driving vehicles. So we are more focusing on niche applications in maritime, in AGVs, in uh, underwater ROVs to bring these deep technologies there so that such systems can operate autonomously or semi-autonomously -autonom in open, dynamic and uh, unconditioned environments. And what we observe and what is our main challenge is not so much technical, although safety is, of course, a very, very important topic here, but also that if you look at such a system, either a boat or an underwater ROV or an AGV, it's part of a, of, let's say, of a, of a, of a logistics chain. And it's very hard, or if not impossible, to only automate a single piece in that logistics chain and create value, because we need to create value, otherwise we don't have a business. You know you need to look at the whole logistics chain and make, let's say, um, improvements or automation over the complete logistics chain in order to create value with these autonomous technologies. And for that, you need a lot of players, right? You need a governmental institutions for the legislation. Uh, you need to work with your partners in the value chain. So it's it's um, it's really a joint effort to bring these autonomous vehicles into our world um, in the coming years. And I'm happy to discuss these challenges and potential solutions uh, during the webinar. Good, thank you very much. Uh, we also recognize uh, these, these challenges, so I'm glad that you bring them up. Uh, the ecosystems are very important. I'll give the floor now to James that he also tell us uh, what they are focusing on. Thank you, Emilia. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is James. I'm with uh, Motional. Motional is a joint venture between Aptiv and Hyundai Motor Group, where we are working on um, driverless vehicles for like a robot taxi fleet, making it a reality. So we are doing um, all the development work and uh, testing in cities across um, Singapore, Boston, Pittsburgh. And currently we have an actual commercial fleet deployed as part of the Lyft network in Las Vegas. Um, so the kind of work we do is uh, you know, regarding perception, planning controls, all the AI in the car um, from the command center, to remote vehicle assistance, to you know, uh, internal validation of um, simulate, uh, we build our own simulation tools, uh, mapping tools, and so on and so forth. Um, personally, for myself, I, I've been in this uh, uh, working on autonomous vehicles since uh, uh, 2013. So my 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 journey went from academia to startup, and that startup, you know, eventually now is, uh, has grown into this joint venture and. 
And I have uh, over the years, you know, touched many different parts of the stack. And, and yeah, so this is, um, this is my introduction in a nutshell. Okay, thank you, James. Um, thank you all for the, for the introduction and, and mentioning your topics. I also uh, want to mention my background. Um, I'm part-time assistant professor at the University in Eindhoven, and for the majority of my time, I work at the Dutch Applied Research TNO, so I'm a colleague with Olaf. Um, now I think we can approach the questions that we have prepared. So uh, what we are seeing is that um, each of us are working on different applications and different domains. We see um, specific challenges that come from these domains, but we also see um, some common challenges. And that's why we are here today to discuss about those. Um, I would like to now draw your attention to a small video that, that you can find on the internet. And there are multiple uh, videos like this, but uh, this is a, a review from a journalist. I will see if I can play which was driving in a Waymo car um, not even a year ago um, at a tech show to, to check how is this working. And as you can see uh, from the video, the car drives itself. Um, you will notice on the sides that there are other cars uh, passing by. It's a very urban or urban environment. Um, you have uh, a different uh, scene, uh, or a complex scene. The car makes turns to the right or to the left. Um, so it, it it has all the capabilities uh, a car should have. It can probably perceive very well the environment. Uh, it takes decisions where to go. Um, it, it probably um, uh, ensures that everything is safe. So from this point of view, as you can see, um, if we handle intersections, if we have all, handle um, all kinds of complex traffic scenarios, we could say, well, it's done, right? Um, so. Uh, automated driving is on the road. Automated technologies, not only for automated driving, um, are there. Uh, from perception, decision making, and control, these modules are mature enough. And with the artificial intelligence therein, um, we came up with the following statement, and we would like to hear our speaker's opinion about it. So the statement is artificial intelligence is safe, mature, and ready to be used on the road without a backup driver. And here I refer to maybe autonomous driving, but we can also talk about different applications depending um, what the speakers uh, want to touch upon. And I will give uh, maybe first, I will give the floor to all of you to see who would like to start have an opinion about this. Do you agree or disagree? Um, is artificial intelligence ready and the systems that contain artificial intelligence, are they ready and mature enough to be used without the backup driver? If I don't address any speaker, um, then maybe- Okay, Akash here, start. I think uh, I can start. Uh, Thanks, Akash. Yeah, it's a, so Emilia, it's a heavy question. And I'll dare to say on our behalf, yes, but. And I, I could say that at Volvo Group, we have a focus on offering safe and tested solutions to our customer needs. Uh, however, we see a lot of applications where automated solutions are already safe and in many cases desirable. And for example, underground mines where we have uh, Volvo construction equipment or Volvo construction trucks running. We have controlled access job sites uh, we have repetitive low traffic routes or uh, let's say bus depots, which makes it possible. So uh, these are areas where it's, it's natural where this technology works today. However, on road driving, uh, and, and I guess that that is what mainly your question pertains to, it is obvious that uh, it's very interesting, but I see a long journey ahead there as it is adapted to be effective in different countries and use environments and cultures and legislative contexts. So we have still a lot of work to do there. I agree. So indeed, the, the question is a bit more um, with the flavor from road transport because um, yeah, there the backup driver is really uh, now with the systems from Tesla and all the autopilots and the other systems that we see now um, do contain, rely a lot on the driver. So um, in, in their policies and in their terms and conditions, the driver is always the backup system. But I'm also interested, for example, to hear from um, Heis, what, how does this look for a maritime application or uh, other applications? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, 
I think the more open uh, and dynamic and unconditioned your environment is, the more difficult is, it is to bring AI in that environment safely. Um, now, if you think about the open ocean, uh, there, there, is not, uh, there are not that much challenges, uh, but where we focus on is really in, these, in the harbor. Basically, the logistics step from getting containers out of the ship onto the truck and then and automating that, that complete uh, chain over there. And there you see a lot of uh, similar uh, challenges. So uh, currently, yeah, you have these fully automated uh, container terminals, but they are completely closed off areas. Humans are not allowed to go there. And if you want to scale this up and uh, also want to have hybrid solutions where humans can also operate in such an environment, then you touch almost on the same issues uh, that you see when you want to drive an autonomous vehicle in a city like Amsterdam or uh, anywhere else in the world. Um, and then it becomes much more difficult. So where we focus on for now is more uh, the environments where we can, where it's more normal to drive with low speeds. Uh, so by, simply by lowering the speed, we can be more safe. And I can imagine that also in, in, in more in the autonomous driving context in cities, what you could think of is of course automated parcel delivery, uh, uh, all kinds of utility vehicles that don't have to drive that fast from A to B or uh, redistributing, uh, um, let's say, uh, vehicles, uh, shared vehicles across a network during the night at low speed. I, th I think that th all those kinds of applications can already be safe. But let's say that the everyday usage of vehicles as we use it today, I think that is indeed still uh, very, um, yeah, it's, it's several years in the future before we can have AI fully autonomous operating such, uh, such vehicles. Okay, that, that's, that's very interesting. I want to mention for the audience that you have the possibility to put, que put questions in the chat and we will have a look at them. There's also going to be a question and uh, answer session at the end of all the three questions. Um, you're also receiving polls with the same questions such that we hear your opinion about it. Um, but I will continue now with the speakers. So uh, thank you guys for, for the view from the ports and maritime point of view and, and the idea that lowering speeds or uh, you can deal with more complex environments. I'm wondering for, uh, um, for James, for example, if you have artificial intelligence in your autonomous systems, how would you, because Akash was saying, well, uh, we are all, yes, but, um, is that the same feeling that you have? And what, what would you say about the readiness level? Because AI is going to be a component or, the, or it's going to be a bigger component in your system, but still you have to think about components and systems and how would you, what's your comment about, uh, about the readiness level? Um, well, driverless vehicles have definitely come a long way. They're a lot more safer, you know, uh, a lot more uh, intelligent right now if you compare to the days of the DARPA challenge, right? So over the past 10, 13, 15 years, you know, we've made a lot of progress. Um, but, you know, well, the reality is not all roads in the world are built the same. Not all cities are the same. Not, you know, uh, not all traffic conditions are the same. Uh, so some places are easier, some places are a little harder. So, you know, as mentioned, you know, depending on the, the use case, uh, some is definitely ready uh, right now. Um, there are some more complicated cities where, you know, where, where the traffic is much heavier and maybe drivers are a little bit more aggressive. That's a little harder. But generally, you know, the technology is safe. You know, we have come a long way. Um, but, you know, when we think about safety, there's a lot of many facets to it. You know, because when you see in a car, you know, if a car is moving slowly, very quickly, even though it's safe, you want it to go faster. Right? And then you start to compare it to like a taxi driver. Actually, subtly, a lot of uh, passengers in a car, what, you know, although you say, you know, although we say we want it to be safe, we sometimes want it to be aggressively, humanly safe. Right? And that's where it becomes a, little, uh, a bit more challenging. Right? You want the car to go faster. You want the car to cut people off. You want the car to drive a little more dangerously to get you to your location faster, but you want it to be safe, right? Uh, if the car were to go slowly, you know, and reach the destination, you know, that's something I think, you know, many, many companies can do right now. Um, the challenge is to get there to your destination quickly and still safely. Yeah, I think this is a, this is still an interesting problem that all of us are still eager <laughs> to solve. Yeah, so let's come back to the how exactly to drive and the differences between countries a little bit later. But would you say that depending really on the application and on the domain that we're talking about, 
artificial intelligence and its integration is more ready for um, for uh, fixed op op ODDs, fixed operational design domains, or restricted areas, or semi-restricted areas, or are we ready to talk about the open road application and um, yeah, really put these technologies at the large scale on the road? Yeah, I think for fixed ODDs, if it's in a restricted area, this is the, you know this is already you know uh, uh, this is already being done right now. But if you're talking about open road, you know like an urban city, uh, whole city with 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 uh, driving side by side with other human drivers, I think uh, you know I think we still have uh, you know some way to go. Okay. I want to also look at Olaf and ask him um, how about assessment of these systems? Where are we now and what are the challenges you've seen? Because you have mentioned in your slide that you're uh, heavily focusing on this. Um, yeah, what? where are we now? Yeah, if, if you look to the video, I, I think it's it's very impressive that you see what the capabilities of, of uh, vehicles are in even, let's say, more uh, difficult situations with a lot of uh, dynamic uh, actors in the in the neighborhood of the of the the system um and that shows that uh, ai is really needed i think in 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 vehicles to be able to deal with these multiple um uh, acting factors on on vehicles not only of all the different uh, uh, traffic participants that behave differently but also the different circumstances that we uh, that we face in in of course, also uh, different uh, traffic rules, different uh, traffic densities. Um, still, I would would say that the, the to the question uh, that is uh, still on on the screen, I would say uh, a no. And um, I think currently we are not we are not uh, there yet, and especially not with a backup uh, driver so far, at least on public roads. Um, and, and the, the, the reason is that if we look to um, even more uh, conventional uh, systems, that there is a we have a, a huge tree of uh, possible tests to check uh, whether these systems behave uh, according to expectation, behave safely under all these different uh, circumstances. And um, many systems already are capable of showing that they work according to uh, uh, those principles in, in, in a safe way. The problem with, uh, for me, uh, for uh, the use of artificial intelligence is that um, um, proving and explaining uh, the safety of, uh, of such a system. And if only looking to uh, the operational design domain of an, of an AI system, um, I think it's very difficult to show even what the real ODD of a, of a system is and how does uh, AI behave um, within the ODD, okay, but what is uh, happening on the boundaries of the, uh, of the ODD and is it aware that it might cross uh, the boundary of the ODD? I think that it's, it's really difficult to, uh, uh, to deal with that. And I think that that, that is something that, that we need to solve to be able to uh, get uh, the backup driver out of the out of the, the, the seat. Uh, Amelia, I think you may need to check your mic again because we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, good. So I was saying if we look at countries like the Netherlands and the Singapore, which are in many aspects similar, this is one of the topics that we need to get together and, and have more discussions about. So from a technological point of view uh, and, and functions and algorithms, we say, yes, we are there, um, but maybe for specific applications and restricted environments. And for um, from a certification and assessment and validation and verification point of view, maybe there are still a lot of questions to uh, be answered. I looked also at the um, uh, audience and what they have said, and uh, there is a predominantly answer on no uh, for this question. So I think there, again, the opinions are split. Um, so thank you for this one. I would like to go to the next, uh, next question, um, which is related to 
um, for example, have a look at this picture. Uh, we see a very complex uh, environment. This is a street from Amsterdam uh, where you see um, cyclists, you see cars, you see motorcycles. Uh, I have to say this is a more uh, crowded one, but nevertheless, if we have autonomous driving on the road and if we have mobility as a, uh, a service uh, with different modes of transportation trying to cover these areas, then the challenges are quite complex. So one of the questions that uh, appears oftentimes in conferences and in events in the last years is should the autonomous uh, vehicle or the autonomous shuttle uh, or any other transport means uh, drive in any way like a, a human driver or consider any human aspects when driving. So here I have a, uh, let's see, picture for you, a video just to show you how it looks like. So um, what you can envision for this specific environment is that the driver has, uh, not the driver, the, the, the users, all of them have a very good capability of predicting where others are going, understanding what their movements in the future and decisions in the future will be just by looking at each other's eyes or intentions. Um, and that makes it very easy to, um, to follow a certain path or to go uh, to your destination. So if we take this into account, these very complex, uh, complex environments, the question that I mentioned before, should automated driving cars, um, and here I'm also uh, talking about uh, other transport means if you want to touch upon those uh, like buses or uh, boats or anything else, should they drive like a human? Yes or no and why? Um, could you address that? And I will directly the floor, um, James, back to James, because he had a comment about the countries are different and there are different things from uh, culture to culture and from population to population. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I think first is, you know, self-driving cars should, should drive um, safer than a human. Uh, and sometimes it may not necessarily uh, mimic a human behavior. But on the other hand, um, the reality is um, um, uh, autonomous vehicles are driving side by side with other human uh, agents, you know, uh, drivers and, and cyclists. So there is a certain expectation that, you know, a, a driver may have of someone else. So, for, so just to give an example, <clears throat> uh, culturally, you know, from city to city, and this is what we also notice in Pittsburgh, Boston, and, and Singapore, um, people drive differently. And what's also interesting is people in different cities and countries break different kinds of rules, right? They tend to break different kinds of rules. So, you know, um, that, that could be uh, uh, an example is uh, if I'm in Boston and if I'm, if I'm a, uh, driving, right, if there is a jaywalker crossing, there's a high tendency for drivers to slow down and give way to, to other drivers. And I believe, you know, it's probably the same in many European countries. In Singapore, however, right, it's, it's, uh, it's common to see, you know, uh, a driver uh, slightly speed up or maintain speed to to discourage a jaywalker to jaywalk. So now the question is, if if you are a driver behind, you know this this driver who is reacting to the pedestrian, you know you have a certain expectation, and it could depend from country to country. In certain cases, you expect the car in front to move forward. In other cases, you expect it to to slow down. So I think it's, it's also important, you know, that the car drive what in a way that what uh, other people, ex, you know, expect it to drive, and, and and that also makes it a lot safer. So what you're what you're saying is that the car should have should act in a predictable way, and predictability this predictable yeah. capability differs from country to country. Um, and I guess that that's true. Is it possible to learn that from the data with AI algorithms? And is is it possible to distinguish between desired behaviors and undesired behaviors? Yes, de de definitely. Um, so, you know, so we believe that uh, <clears throat> um, rules of the road, you know, both uh, legislative rules and also uh, cultural rules, you know, can, can be constructed into a certain hierarchy where certain rules are more important than others. For example, you know, the rule of not hitting someone is more important than not crossing over a, a Chevron line, for example. And, and, and we can learn uh, you know, which rules are more commonly broken in, 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 from city to city and, and, you know, using uh, machine learning techniques is, is a, a great way to, to learn, you know, to, to figure out this, this kind of hierarchy. 
Okay, and, and then now I'm going to look at Akash and ask, do you also look at these aspects and do you, um, can, can you also distinguish between, uh, can you give me examples of flavors that you see because you have multiple locations with your company. So I guess you, you've seen a result from different countries and different, uh, different cultural aspects on what we can expect from automated uh, technologies. Yeah, first of all, I think if I remain on a high level, I'd like to say that in the last 100, 120 years, we've not even been able to sort out around the world or harmonize what is a left-hand drive market and what is a right-hand drive market. I mean, we still have those differences, yeah? So going on this path is not easy. Automated vehicles, of course, should do no harm. That's most important. Their success will depend on the ability of the technology to be able to fit to the user with being in the center or whatever is being done. Uh, while there'll be an initial period of adjustments, we feel no one expects a modern car or a bus to behave like a horse carriage. Uh, I don't know how many people know, but in the initial days, and I'm talking 100 plus years back, I believe that people were actually employed when cars started to walk in front of the cars with flags so that they could clear the road for them and there were speed limits. So it's a journey and we will get there. Okay, that's that's uh, that's clear. Um, Heinz, do you want to add anything to this? Do you see do you see in the Netherlands certain aspects that you want to uh, put from a human perspective to automated uh, driving technologies, or something that you want to specifically take out? Yeah, uh, so it's a good question. Uh, um, my answer would be: uh, Should they drive like a human uh, in the Netherlands? Because what you basically see in the Netherlands is that. You have to drive a bit aggressively. If you don't drive ag aggressively, you will never uh, get over that intersection that you just showed in the video. Uh, that, that also comes back to the, um, the comments of, of James. So uh, I'm afraid that in the Netherlands, yes, we have to drive uh, uh, like a human, otherwise you're standing still uh, a, a, a lot of the time. So what I then also find important is that these autonomous vehicles can communicate back to other uh, uh, road users, human road users, in, in, in a very, um, you know, let's say, intuitive and, 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 and understandable uh, way. And of course, there's also a lot of research on that, how vehicles, autonomous vehicles can communicate to the outside world. And I think that is also a very important uh, so not only driving like a human, but also interact with, with the humans that are outside or like Akash said, the users which are in a bus. Uh, yeah. So the human overall in the whole ecosystem plays an important role and we need yeah. to understand what the needs are. What is, um, what is also we, important, I think, is that the autonomous vehicle basically can communicate its intentions and its uh, future decisions and why it is making those decisions. Uh, to, to become, uh, uh, what Olaf said, explainable and transparent to the users inside the vehicle, but also the other road participants outside of the vehicle. But how do we ensure, we have done in, uh, with some of my students and, and some collaborators, we have looked into the human aspects that should go into um, automated driving. And we also have a group at TNO that looks into that. Um, we have identified that there are a lot of human behaviors that you do not want to bring in in autonomous driving. For example, uh, driving in a rushed way or uh, being uh, dizzy or being uh, driving under the influence of alcohol. Those are patterns that are influencing the data that you see. Um, is it actually possible to distinguish between these behaviors and, and how can we, and I'm going to also then give the floor to Olaf to ask, how can we specify these capabilities for an algorithm and how can we ensure that we can test these things uh, once we say, because it's easy to claim it should be like a human, but then how do we, can we specify it to be uh, done in a proper way? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, if you if you look to to driving and and case already touch case already uh, touched upon that. It's it's uh, if if I look to the again that that movie in in in, in Amsterdam, there's continuous negotiation between all the different uh, traffic participants and anticipation uh, that goes both ways. And I think it's it's extremely uh, um, difficult to get that level of uh, anticipation into an automated vehicle. Maybe AI there is a, a part of the solution, but that means also communication and communication uh, to the outside world. Oh, this is my intention, and this is the reason that I do it. I think it should also be um, very clear to the other road users what what is meant uh, uh, by that. And now, um, 
it's different people behave differently. So if we say, okay, an, an, an automated vehicle should drive like, like a human, then my first question would be, okay, and, and which human do you then take? It should, should drive at least better than, than, than myself or at least better than the, the average uh, uh, driver. Uh, and we all know that if you have a driving license, you think uh, I'm one of the best drivers in, in, in the world. That cannot be the case because there's a, a huge uh, distribution in, in, the, in the way we drive on the, on, on the road. So what would be our reference to, uh, to driving? And of course, there's a lot to learn from uh, behavior, current behavior on the, on the road uh, to be sure that the, the uh, behavior that an AV shows in, in the end on, on the road um, um, uh, is in agreement with, let's say, maybe uh, the majority of good uh, driving. That means that we need an analysis of uh, what is then uh, uh, accepted, maybe accepted what is good driving and how to quantify that. That, that's extremely important and that are also things that we are uh, currently busy with to, to um, not only um, uh, to, to get um, the algorithms in, in vehicles up to a level that they uh, might mimic uh, human behavior, but also to uh, actually test uh, current systems because that behavior is already there on, on the road and, and current vehicles should also uh, be able to deal with that type of, uh, of behavior. So that's, that's a large part of the work that we do is um, getting access to what is, what is normal uh, behavior. How do uh, uh, vehicles, but also pedestrians, uh, cyclists, uh, other road users, how do they behave? And what are, let's say, uh, the corner cases to both sides of the, uh, of the, of the spectrum? And, and that is important knowledge to, to be used uh, also in the development of, uh, of future systems. Okay, thank you. Uh, I I understand um, the, the 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 reasons and the motivation that you're mentioning, and I think that's uh, something that everybody should think about. Um, I'm going to because we get a lot of uh, questions in the chat, which are very nice. I'm going to use one or two of them such that we uh, hear your opinions about them. Um, related to what Olaf mentioned, and also what um, everybody was touching upon. Um, one of the questions is, what are your thoughts on a new generic rule for automated cars on how to behave, like having a new global uh, rule for that? Um, one second, then, because I see more questions popping up and I lost the one that I was uh, addressing. Um, so despite the differences between different countries, should we or should we not have a global rule um, in cases where AI is being used? What do you think? If I may, may start here, um, I, I think that that, um, that is extremely difficult. I, I, I do understand the, uh, the need uh, for or, or the possibility if you have a global rule, then everybody can, can stick to that and that, that might, might work. But how to come to such a, a global rule, how to harmonize uh, that behavior, if you look to all these different countries that, that really show uh, different behavior on the road. If I if I compare only the, the traffic system in, in Singapore with that in, in the Netherlands, then my feeling at least is that in, in Singapore um, we more stick to the much more stick to the to the traffic rules than we do in the, in, in, in the Netherlands. And how do we deal with that? I mean it, it, I think it's it's I do understand the basic idea of uh, harmonizing such uh, uh, such rules. But I think it's extremely difficult to come to such to such a rule, and that should not uh, hamper us in 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 getting the innovation further. Does that mean that the rules have to be in one in in a way at the local ecosystems level and at the local national level, maybe, and also try to uh, make them uniform uh, by having collaborative discussions and trying to find consensus across countries? But of course, you cannot make everything very global because then it's either too restrictive or it's impossible to implement and it's not feasible. Is that the proper summary? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay, then I'll take a few more questions because they are very interesting. We have Albert asking, what is the panel opinion about autonomous vehicles dependency on infrastructure? Um, quality of roads, road lane markings, sufficient uh, signage on the roads, 
Um, do you have any take on that? I think Akarsh here, I could just add that, yes, that is for us a very important aspect as an OEM. Uh, the performance of our vehicles world over, whether it's trucks or buses or construction equipment is very, very dependent on what kind of infrastructure is available. Um, uh, uh, even if uh, companies like ours, who, which operate more or less everywhere in the world, you need to design vehicles uh, uh, which are main, more or less the same. However, when you come to some traditional areas where the infrastructure is weak, then you you need to do some more things than what you do on a normal product. So I guess that as we move towards uh, AI and automated solutions, this problem will not walk away. The problem shall certainly stay there and it's a difficult one to deal with. And in the same light, I could also mention on the last question on rules and regulations to be harmonized across the world. A, again, I think over the years, it's, it's rather been very difficult to do that because uh, when, when we talk of harmonizing rules and regulations, it gets into an aspect which is not technical, which is not about machine, but it is about people, it's about politics, it's about culture, and that creates the added difficulty in what we do. I also saw one of the questions here where somebody brought up the good point of partnerships. And I think that is something which is very different for us as OEMs. 20 years back when we used to do something, we would do everything ourselves. Today, when we do something, and for example, put a electric bus system with a bit of an automotive technology in Gothenburg, our hometown in Sweden, we have 150 buses being introduced there. And we are not doing it alone. We have 27 partners with us. So the government needs to come on, the academia needs to come on, uh, all parts of the society needs to be involved, and only then uh, we will have success towards AI as well as uh, more and better automotive technologies. Okay, thank you indeed. Um, it has increased in collaborations and also the needs of, of um, uh, being in a more integrated way in the ecosystems where you function, I, I guess. Um, with that last comment in mind, with the one on policies and rules, I'd like to go to, to the last statement we have prepared for you and hear your opinion about it. Um, and that is related to um, the fact that when you put any automated system on the road, you are interacting. And some of the, the speakers and some of the uh, people in the audience have also asked about this. Uh, what are the needs and um, how much connectivity and reliance on the infrastructure should we have? And here I put a few uh, keywords. We have uh, think about GPS uh, and uh, technologies needed for localization. And here's a road, a picture of a road, but I can imagine that for heist, that's also a picture of a sea. And um, the Wi-Fi technologies that are used either for vehicle to vehicle or the infrastructure from vehicle to everything or from boat to everything. Um, the idea that we not we don't need to be optimal at uh, a vehicle or a single uh, agent level, but we need to be optimal at the system of systems level. Brings up the question: What is it? Uh, what is it needed in terms of policies and local ecosystems? So the statement we we uh, prepared is that the ecosystems, the policies, everything is ready, and mobility as a service and automated technologies. Uh, can be easily integrated in the ecosystems and the policies are welcoming them. And I want, would like to hear your opinion about um, what is, is this true, yes or no? And what do you think are still the needs on these aspects? And I, I will see who wants to start first. Maybe I can give a nice uh, example uh, of where, where this was in play. So think about automated parcel delivery. Um, then so many, indeed, so many partners have to come together. And then, then it's always uh, the question, uh, uh, yeah, who is going to make this necessary investments in the things that you, the common things that you need, like the infrastructure, or in the case of parcel delivery, it was kind of some kind of common hub. Uh, where, the, where the trucks deliver their parcels and then from there the robots take over uh, and deliver it to your home, then uh, does every uh, parcel delivery company does need to have its own hub or can we have a shared hub and then who is going to invest in the shared hub and so on. And then you come into so many discussions on, on who's going to invest where. 
that I think the um, it's also the responsibility of the governments uh, uh, to at least uh, create an ecosystem in which uh, it's uh, um, an, an, an investment ecosystem where it is uh, uh, easier or less risky to invest in such the rollout of such technology. Okay, so it's about investments, infrastructure changes, who is going to invest, who is going to focus on that, whose responsibility is it? Um, I'm looking maybe at um, also at, at the other speakers, do you want to comment on that? Or do you all agree with the, the statement of Heis? And, then my, and my question would be no. So we're not, the, it's not yet, there we are not there yet to have such an ecosystem <laughs> yes my my mind also goes into uh so it's the infrastructure which needs to be ready uh but i'm also thinking about when something goes wrong because there's more and more automation more complex systems more software uh, we rely more and more on uh, complex software if something goes wrong uh, say that you cross with um with the car through an intersection where you have got information from the infrastructure and something wrong happens um responsibility and how do we look uh, from a policy making to that do you see any challenges there or from your local ecosystems because we have Heis and Olaf in the Netherlands and we have uh, James and Akash in Singapore so I'm looking to see are there any differences do you see any challenges here I think it's a, it's it's the, the difficulty is going to uh, higher, higher automation level, so getting getting uh, the safety driver out of the out of the, the vehicle, uh, which means that the, the the system itself must be very well equipped to make the interpretation of the of the, the world around under any circumstances. Uh, now I think that we can easily come up with uh, examples where, um, from the perspective of the vehicle itself. It's not sufficient. It, it does not receive sufficient information to prevent uh, an accident. It could be, for instance, that you get an emergency vehicle uh, crossing around uh, uh, a corner, and how does the AV then have to behave uh, responsive to that emergency vehicle? So, in that respect, I think that communication and, and uh, communication technology is extremely important to make. Uh, automation possible in the uh, in, in in the future to these uh, to these higher levels, so we should prepare our ecosystems to uh, to deal with that, and of course then also uh, uh, the policies uh, should be there. Regarding policy, um, uh, we were just talking about uh, um, uh, global uh, traffic rules, and is that a, a, a possibility uh, uh, to to uh, to influence that? Um, I think it's not possible to have these, these uh, traffic rules uh, globally, but what we uh, could do is, and, and that's also something that, that uh, we are heavily uh, involved in, is in harmonizing the procedures for such assessment. I think, and then you can deal with different rules in different uh, ecosystems in different uh, uh, countries and use the same uh, uh, procedures, uh, way of working, uh, to to make uh, such an assessment, which makes it more easy for um, uh, for industry, but also for authorities to be capable of understanding the results of such uh, such assessment. But that such assessment should then also include okay, what is then uh, the the uh, information that the ecosystem could provide to to such systems. And I think, Olaf, I'll agree with your point on communication because communication is really important between vehicle to vehicle inside the vehicle systems and vehicle to external sources. Uh, however, I think I'd also like to uh, remind everyone here that as an OEM, of course, and I think we see it and everyone does, the rapid strides which are being made in technology. So even if we are not being, uh, we don't have a fully automated vehicle, oh, every single year or every year or two, when you change your car or you change your equipment on a truck or a bus, you see many more modern automated systems which get added on. Today, it is normal to find an adaptive cruise control is, is, is a way of life. Parking assistance is a recent way of life. Lane departure warnings is a recent way of life. So as we move on from one year to another, even if the overall roadmap is not ready because of lack of uh, some, some directions or complete technology being available, a lot of it is getting added on step by step, which is making life easier, 
for the driver leading to one single day when there would be no driver behind it. Uh, um, yeah, that's, that's indeed um, uh, true and challenging. Um, if you think about the previous older ways of certifying and validating and verifying a car with these, uh, also including uh, these new uh, others kind of technologies, do you think when we talk about artificial intelligence that something should change in the way we um, we validate and, and we verify the, the, the systems and should that how transparent should that be towards the public such that the public has acceptance and trust in the systems that they are uh, faced with? Again, if I can make a short comment, I think at Volvo we see three key areas when it comes to automated vehicle with the help of AI and I think one area is technology, which you're talking about. And we see that technology is something which is moving fast and rapidly catching on. So over a coming period of time, technology will not be the showstopper. But there are two other areas which are equally important and which need more attention and where more work needs to be done. And one is people's behavior. People's behavior, the ones who drive it, the ones who travel in it, or the ones who are around the vehicles. That is something where where the public is not ready yet. And that in itself needs a lot of study as, as we feel. And lastly, of course, you talked about for yourself, Amelia, harmonization of rules. There is yet a lot to be done in that space. Technology over the years has moved quite far ahead, but the rules and regulations don't seem to be catching up in a harmonized manner across regions or different parts of the world with the same, same speed. So that, so unless these three blocks, and maybe I'm, I miss another one or two, don't come together, the whole thing doesn't work. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I'm glad we touched upon these three topics. I hope the audience also enjoyed your opinions. I would like to, to look a little bit more at the questions from the audience and ask your opinions about them because we are approaching at the end of the, this webinar. So uh, here I will go to questions, but I will just take a few from the audience because um, um, you can still add questions uh, from the audience in the chat and I will have a look at them. Um, maybe I start with James uh, because I have not given him the floor um, in the last uh, in the last question. What are the standards? Uh, question from the audience. What are the standards that you follow to ensure the secure design of an autonomous car for your applications? Um, so you know, I think I think most companies are following you know similar standards. You know, like ISO two six two six two. You know, and you know, um, and um, but I think a lot of these standards, you know, were, were, were originally designed not for driverless vehicles. Um, so to a large extent, you know, even with, within Motional, we have to come up with a lot of internal standards as well that we hold ourselves to, which is actually even more rigorous. Um, we, because we, we, we want to make sure, you know, that everything, you know, any form of behavior that the car makes can be uh, very traceable. Right. I mean, this also helps with development as well, you know, so that if you see an undesired behavior, we can pinpoint why is it undesirable and we can trace back to, you know, what, what caused that, that behavior. And also, um, you, know, um, you know, other forms of way that we test the system through um, uh, simulations, closed cost testing. So, you know, um, we, we make use of, um, you know, standards, which, which, which uh, many companies are using at the moment. Uh, but I think uh, these standards at the moment I feel is, is, is insufficient and therefore we have to also you know, uh, uh, do additional things internally. Okay, and uh, Hais, is that similar for you? Do you also see that the current standards are lacking certain aspects and you also become more uh, strict internally and, and develop new validation procedures? Yeah, that's definitely a, a, a big concern to us, of course, as a relatively small startup. Uh, dealing with these existing standards is also extremely uh, challenging uh, to us. So we are we are really uh, looking. Uh, that's why we're also looking more at niche applications, where uh, rolling out these technologies uh, um, is is a bit easier with respect to safety standards and so on. But sooner or later we have to face it. But I fully agree that the current standards are not yet completely yeah, tailored towards the needs from autonomous uh, driving. Okay, thank you. And then I'm looking at Akash because Akash is coming from a much larger company. So I guess he uh, can also have a different angle on this.
Akash, you are still muted if you want to comment on uh, on this. Sorry, Amelia, I was typing in an answer. Please go ahead. I missed the question. So uh, I was wondering which standards do you use to ensure safety, which procedures? And um, James was mentioning that the, the current standards are one aspect and then they also internally look at more validation, more verification and create, let's say, own internal standards for quality and uh, validation. And uh, Heis, do, Heis was saying from a st stand up of a startup, you first have to comply with the current standards, which are already a, a, an interesting point, and uh, work on, on new uh, standards. But indeed, uh, they, they were recognizing the need of, let's say, uh, improved or new uh, standards. How is it for you at Volvo? Well, I, I think that uh, I, I would have a much simpler answer to this. For us, everything is driven around our core values of quality, safety, and care for the environment. So I think that is what governs us, and primarily safety. Uh, whatever we do has to be safe. And, and of course, that is where most of our on, on our standards. Okay, we lost you for a second, but the main idea and the main message I understood was that safety is primary. Um, so I think Olaf agrees with that. I also want to ask the last question bef before we uh, give back the floor to Wayman. Um, Olaf, if you look at the possibility of having scenarios or um, some sort of harmonization across countries or at least in EU, um, do you think these scenarios need to change uh, for or the standards need to change when you consider artificial intelligence systems, which are um, trained on a certain data set or um, what do you do you see any uh, anything in in that direction are we going to use scenarios for testing artificial intelligence and will they be different um actually i don't think that uh, uh, scenarios uh, itself they will change from from uh, maybe from continent to continent or from from country to country but in in the end um these scenarios are uh, describing what is happening on the on the road and any vehicle should be capable of dealing with that so i don't think that we ha will have specific uh, scenarios in in testing the complete vehicle system if it's ai considered or let's say more the traditional uh, control systems uh, but it is it will be very important to uh, to get harmonization in in how to use uh, such uh, scenarios across uh, uh, the world of course you have those standards like ISO 26262 that, that's 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 great to have them, and we will uh, uh, behave according to those uh, standards. Also, SOTIF is is important, but if we look to the vehicle as a whole, um, then I think that uh, in addition to uh, uh, testing according to these standards, we will need uh, scenario based testing, and I don't think that that will will change for different uh, uh, type of uh, of systems. And certainly, these scenarios will challenge also the ODD of an AI system. So. I, I would think that we will uh, um, be able to uh, uh, at least uh, come up with a kind of safety rating for such systems as well. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you all for all the thoughts and uh, sharing with us your opinion and sharing insights from, from your companies and from your applications. Um, I want to uh, close the, the webinar now. I will give back the floor to Wei Min for the final, uh, final words. Um, from a Dutch uh, AI coalition point of view, uh, we are very much open for collaborations and to bring uh, topics together and challenges together. So please drop us an email, uh, go to our website and uh, you will find there a uh, general mailing address that you can approach the whole coalition for different topics or you can find the mailing, mailing address for mobility, transport and logistics, which reaches me and my colleagues. Um, thank you for joining today and for the, all the interesting questions. To all the speakers, uh, also thank you for joining. Uh, very nice discussions. I hope you have a, a few more minutes to answer a few more uh, of the questions in the chat. Um, thank you for the ones that you have already answered. Uh, Wayman, I will give back the floor to you. Um, thank you for organizing this and thank you for having us here. Yep, thank you, Amelia, for the great interaction with the speakers. I think there were really great points brought up from everyone. On a personal basis, I'm definitely excited to be able to um, sit in a self-driving vehicle in the future. Hope that will not take too long to happen in Singapore. Um, that being said, I would like to represent SG Novate to thank all the attendees who have stayed with us until now. Uh, I would like to say a very big thank you to all our speakers, um, Olaf, Akash, uh, Akash James, uh, Kais for the webinar and the great insights and discussion points shared by everyone. 
uh, today attendees, do keep a lookout for our post-event mail, which will contain a recording of this session. Do reach out to us at events at suniv.com if you would like to connect with any of our speakers or just to have a chat with us for collaboration opportunities. Do also remember to give us your post-event feedback when you exit the webinar or through the post-event mail as well. With that, uh, this is Wei Min signing off for this webinar. Hope that everyone will have a great day ahead. Stay safe, stay healthy. Hope to have you again on our next webinar session. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.